today's topic is regional trade blocks or regional economic integration. As you know, regional trade blocks are very important and uh, play influential role in terms of uh, uh, its own importance from the point of view of international business people. So in terms of, let's say you want to expand into European countries or you want to expand into Asian countries, uh, you know, so you have to look at regional trade blocks in those regions in, in those countries, you know, and uh, uh, you can also see that uh, regional trade blocks like European Union and its implications need to be studied. And in Asia, ASEAN, in North America, North American Free Trade Agreement. And likewise, in every region in the world, you can find the regional trade blocks. The level of integration varies substantially. Uh, but uh, in, in general, they offer significant opportunities or important uh, avenues and platforms for companies to expand in terms of uh, opportunities. For example, if you have a company from America to expand into European Union and you identify a location or you identify a place in the European Union, uh, for example, low cost destination in European Union, as well as high cost location in European Union. And you would find that uh, European Union offers, European Union has got high cost locations and low cost locations and all kinds of locations. And in all kinds of locations, you need to choose a best uh, possible uh, location in terms of integrated area. For example, if there are no restrictions for uh, selling between France and Italy or France and uh, any other country in the European Union, in that case, what happens is that, in that case, uh, um, you can look at countries, you can look at, uh, you can set up a factory in one location, for example, if, if, if let's say if Slovenia is a low cost country, Poland is a low cost country and Poland is part of European Union, you can, you can have a factory in Poland or Slovenia and you can sell in Germany or Netherlands from Slovenia or Poland. So that because there are no restrictions between Poland and Germany, there are no restrictions between Poland and other European Union countries, there are no restrictions between Slovenia and other European Union countries. So you don't have necessarily establish your factory in each and every European Union country. So there are a lot of implications that way. There are a lot of uh, uh, interesting facts that way. And all these uh, can get, uh, uh, you know, realistic when you do the transactions. Yeah. So now I move on. regional trade blocks, there are so what type of regional trade blocks? Regional trade blocks are different types. The first category is preferential trade agreements. Second category is free trade area. Third category is customs area. And the first one, preferential trade agreement, This is uh, under SARC or SAPTA under SARC. So, I mean, this is an example. SARC or SAPTA is an example for preferential trade agreement. What actually happens is that when countries think about a free trade agreement, they start with a preferential trade agreement, which means they eliminate some restrictions, they reduce some barriers, and, 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 and they decide to have uh, a preferential trade agreement uh, under which uh, uh, you know you can see that uh, uh, these these countries do have preferential trade agreement uh, operating between themselves, like South Asian preferential trade agreement under SARC. So this is an interesting phenomenon because uh, SARC uh, 
cannot operate like a full free trade area because of difference of opinion among member countries. Because countries like India and Pakistan are members of SARC, but they don't have full unity because they are not really friends. They are not diplomatic friends. SARC stands for South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. But they decided to think about a free trade area, but they succeeded in terms of uh, preferential trade agreement. There are seven member countries like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, those countries. Um, and and uh, they decided to reduce customs tax and set up a preferential trade agreement as a first step because you need to go step by step when you decide to have regional economic integration because you cannot implement all the integration overnight. You need to think about implementing some steps today implementing some steps next week, implementing some steps, uh, some steps uh, next uh, year and like that. Free trade area uh, is, prefer is equal to free trade area can be considered as free trade area can be defined as a regional area where Number one, preferential trade agreements and uh, you can see NAFTA, AFTA under ASEAN. So here, you know, so this is, this is number one, number one plus removal of all trade barriers. Number one is just a preferential trade agreement, they only uh, reduce customs tax for imports between countries, between member countries. That is number one. However, number two means they eliminate all customs taxes. When member countries of a regional trade block eliminate all customs tariff restrictions, it can be called as free trade area. Free trade area, like some examples. NAFTA, NAFTA stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. AFTA, AFTA under ASEAN. AFTA stands for ASEAN Free Trade Agreement under ASEAN. So these are all examples for free trade areas. And number three is customs area. Number three is another, another advanced form of uh, free trade area. And uh, this customs area is or it can be called as customs area is equal to two plus common import policy with non-members. European Union began as customs union. So customs area means all countries have same customs policies. So a customs area is a classic case of free trade area plus common import policy with non-members. That is what is called as customs area. So these are different advanced forms of regional trade blocks or regional economic integration. We also do have two presentation by two students today. And I do have a couple of videos uh, about uh, ASEAN countries, European Union, NAFTA and so on. So these are examples and let's also look at uh, more examples. Number four, this is another form of regional trade block, or this is an advanced form of regional trade block. Common, it can be called as common market. And common market simply means then their region becomes single market for many things such as labor, services, and capital. So here, Some examples, Gulf Cooperation Council. And number two, Caribbean common markets. Yeah, so these are examples for common markets. But no labor movement between, yeah, so this is an exceptional, exceptional case, uh, you know, Caribbean common market because all Caribbean countries are not part of that CARICOM but uh, they, they are, uh, you know, some other Puerto Rico is not in that, Puerto Rico, is in Puerto Rico is part of the US. 
So, uh, but Gulf Cooperation Council is a classic example of common market. Gulf Cooperation Council, do you know how many members are there? How many member countries are there in Gulf Cooperation Council? Mm -hmm. Can you name some member countries in Gulf Cooperation Council? Nobato, Jafat, Gabriel, Jennifer, Jarlin, are you there? I know from, from experience that the Bahamas and Turks and Caicos are part of our country. Not, not sure about uh, Barbados, though. Uh, you're talking about CARICOM. I, I was asking. Caricom. It's a Gulf Cooperation Council. I think it's it's from Asia or, or um, uh, or, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, and and those countries. Yeah. Somebody else can add uh, more names. I think there is a total of six members. Yes. Kuwait. Is one of them, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia. Yes, there are six members. And uh, what is uh, unique in Gulf Cooperation Council? Why it is called as common market? Uh, um, you know, like previously we had only talked about NAFTA as a free trade area. What is the difference between a free trade area and a classic common market? Like Gulf Cooperation Council, a citizen from United Arab Emirates uh, can travel to other member countries or not, with restriction or without restriction. Why it is called as a common market? Like NAFTA, you also think about NAFTA. NAFTA has US, Mexico, and Canada. Do you think that people from all these three countries can go without any restriction to other countries in NAFTA? Or the free trade is only for commodities? I, I think the common market goes further in, in the restrictions they, they eliminate. The restrictions for what? Not not only tariffs and co and quotas, but they also have other other permitted um things. Mm -hmm. See, the, well, restrictions exist on two grounds. One is restrictions on commodity trade. Second is restrictions on labor. Labor labor means restrictions on people movement services. So. In a free trade area like NAFTA that we talk about free trade area, the number two, the previous forms, you know. So number one is a preliminary form. Number two, free trade area is an advanced form. And number three is a bit more advanced. Number four is very advanced. Number five is most advanced. And number six is the classic form of uh, free world. Okay, this is, uh, there are six uh, types of regional economic groupings or regionally integrated uh, uh, countries in the world. There are six categories. That is what I'm explaining here. So now I'm talking about number four. So if you can read uh, what is written in number four in bracket, what is written in number four in bracket and what is the difference between this and uh, NAFTA? If you go to Gulf Cooperation Council, those are six Arab countries. That's a classic example for a common market, for example. What is the difference? What is the difference you will see in Gulf Cooperation Council region, six countries, and NAFTA, three countries? Uh, you can, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Not a you worry. Uh, go, go you, you go first, sorry. I think uh, the difference is that you can trade labor in the number four and in the number two, it's just commodities. Yeah, tra trading labor means, uh, can you explain this uh, further? Um, maybe you can go to another country just to work without any more restrictions. 
yeah, I, I, I don't mean, know. <laughs> you can you can you you can work in sense in number four. The most important thing is that uh, if a company, let's say, let's say if a UAE company want to hire somebody from Saudi Arabia or Qatar, so uh, their government cannot deny visa. Okay, the government uh, the government uh, has to approve the company's hiring, so it has to it has to be an automatic approval in number four in common market. And suppose in case uh, people from Qatar or Saudi Arabia want to visit UAE or people from Qatar or, or people from UAE or Bahrain, those member countries want to visit Qatar or any other countries, uh, that visit doesn't require any government visa. So uh, visits are freely allowed for citizens among these member countries and, and work permits are automatic. So uh, in case if a company hires someone from another member country, work permit has to be automatic in a common market setup. But in NAFTA, it is not like that. You know about uh, how difficult it is Mexicans to travel to US and Canada? Do you know about it? Hmm? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Professor? My question is, under NAFTA, three countries, Mexico, US, and Canada. Canada. Yeah. Do you know how difficult and complicated it is for someone from Mexico to travel or to work in other two countries? Do you have an idea? I think difficult because a visa is required, right? Yes, and governments can deny visa, even if a company is going to employ someone from Mexico. The government can deny visa. So even if a company is employing someone, government can deny, government can delay, delay visa because in, in, in the US, for example, H-1B visas have quota, quota, you know, so they keep a quota. How many total visas can be kept, given to people from so-and-so countries, and they have a country-wise quota too uh, in, in a year. And in case if they have already given, for example, if they keep 50,000 visas in a year for Mexicans in a year, and in case if they have already given more than 50,000 visa, they will not give visa to people from Mexico, even though Mexico is a member of NAFTA, because NAFTA agreement or free trade agreement, NAFTA is a free trade agreement, it's not a common market agreement. It only covers free trade in goods, free trade in commodities. So it doesn't talk about labor. It doesn't talk about services. It doesn't, you know, labor and services simply means human resources, people. So there are restrictions on people. So, and, and people have to take visa from Canada or US or in case if they have to, even if they, even they have to visit Canada or US, Mexicans need to get a visa and uh, these countries keep a lot of restrictions on visa, even visiting visa, it's very tough to get. They have to provide, they have to prove that they have enough bank deposit, bank savings to travel and spend their money. So, and, and, and they have to go for interview in a consulate or in an embassy, which may not be in their own town. They have to travel to that far away destination to apply for visa. And also there is no guarantee that the government will offer or will give visa. And at the airport, when they arrive, they have they have to face 100 questions. Like I was traveling to Canada once, in fact, uh, and a Mexican was also there, you know. So, um, and, and when I traveled to Canada, so I had my American permanent resident card, what is called as green card. So green card is as good as of uh, passport when you travel to Canada. So they did not ask me questions because they showed my American green card. But this Mexican who was behind me, he did not have this green card or anything. He came from Mexico. And, and the Canadian police uh, authority asked him at least uh, five or six questions. He was grilled uh, about why he want to travel to Canada, why what he's going to do in Canada and those kind of things. So, so those restrictions remain even, in, in, uh, e even though there is NAFTA, but, but because governments are concerned about uh, uh, receiving people. They are not concerned about receiving commodities, but they are concerned about receiving people because uh, commodities don't speak. People speak. Sometimes people create problems. People uh, can turn out to be uh, problematic. 
So there are a lot of issues like that. So that way the governments are concerned about all those kind of things. But in a common market setup, uh, they remove restrictions on people substantially. A lot of restrictions are taken away for uh, accepting or considering people from other countries in a common market region. So that way people find it easy to travel and easy to work in, in a foreign country in case if that country is part of the common market arrangement. Okay, number five, economic community. Economic community, that is number four plus common economic policy. So that is one more step ahead of common market. And uh, so this means number four plus common monetary policy, like European economic community, Euro area, Euro currency area is an example for number five, Euro currency area. You know, some countries in Europe, they have common currency called Euro. They have common monetary policy. So all countries, those who are part of this common currency, Euro, they, that region can be considered as an example for this number five. I mean, that is an advanced form of integration between countries, economic community. That means they have number four plus, they have number, they have number four plus something else. Number, they have a common market plus they have a common monetary policy. It's very good for them because they operate like single country. And number six, number six is economic community plus common parliament. You know, number six is written as a political union, common parliament, like European Union is an example for this. And uh, it's a European Union, it's a political union, and they have a common parliament. So European Union is an example for this number six uh, political union under regional trade blocks. NAFTA, so I'm explaining this one by one. NAFTA or North American Free Trade Agreement. Members, US, Canada, Mexico. And NAFTA agreement became law on law in 1994 and under NAFTA, 99% of the goods traded between these countries are without customs tariffs. No customs tax between Mexico, US and Canada. Products coming from Mexico to the US, there is no customs tax in the US and products are selling, sold in Mexico by American companies or Canadian companies also have no, tax, no customs tax. So some of the examples that uh, we have experienced in San Juan or anywhere else in the US is because of this uh, advantage. I mean, for example, I went to TJ Maxx in Orlando, Florida and I purchased uh, a toothpaste packet and it was a bundle. It was a bundle of three toothpaste tubes. The total price was four bucks, total price was $4. And This was uh, this is mainly because there are no custom tax in 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 U.S. when items come from Mexico, and uh, cost of production in Mexico is relatively low. And this was not a Mexican brand uh, toothpaste. This was American brand Colgate palm olive toothpaste. Three tubes, big tubes, just $4. Can you believe? 
Is it a good idea from point of view of consumers? If there was no NAFTA, there would have been a customs tax on it. So if there was 30 or 40 percentage customs tax, because customs tax, when they keep customs tax, it's relatively high. Normally customs taxes in most countries for many items are 30 percentage, 40 percent and so on. If there was 30 percent customs tax on toothpaste, the price of this toothpaste would have been four dollars multiplied by 30 percent. That would be about uh, six or five and a half dollars. Since there is no customs tax, they are able to sell Mexican made toothpaste of American brand for two or three or four dollars in the US. That is the advantage, that is the impact of NAFTA. So I got two questions. Question number one, do you think that the US firms got more market access to other members because of NAFTA? I would uh, suggest that in case if you can open up your camera so that I'm uh, sure that you are attending the class and otherwise I'm not sure whether how many of you are actually there. So I would prefer if you can do that and answer. I have two questions and I would, I would divide you into three into three because uh, three persons can answer the first question and the other three persons can answer the second question. So first question, um, I see Jafet, Wilfredo, and Noboto sitting there first, and then second question can be answered by Gabriel, Yarlin, and uh, uh, Jennifer. So first question goes to Jafet, uh, and then Wilfredo can add, and uh, uh, Noboto can also add his points. Okay. The question is, do you think that the US companies got more market, more market access to countries like uh, Canada or Mexico because of NAFTA. So what kind of benefits or do you think that the US companies uh, have more uh, benefits or access to more markets because of NAFTA or do you think that the US companies are losers of uh, NAFTA, losers because of NAFTA? So start with Jafat. Well, definitely uh, the United States are, are supposed to be a bigger market, but I think everyone has advantages of, of having a free trade agreement. I don't, I really, I don't, and I think, yes, the U.S. firms got, had like, had more market access if we have no, if we have free trade between them. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't see if there's something negative of having a free trade agreement. Okay, so it's more to well, well I, I think to what Jafet said, um, one of the apparent implications of the regional grouping is to increase the market size. Um, for that said, uh, answering your, que your question is yes. Um, um, the, the country, for example, US, can export to an entire group, which is many times bigger than the country that he has early dealing with. So you, you have a bigger market uh, instead of dealing with only one country. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that the US firm got uh, more, market access, more market access to other members because of NAFTA. So in, I, I also think like Jafet that, that, that you have a, a, a market more more open uh, because you have a, a group. So no butter. Yes, yeah, so I think that the US does indeed have um, some advantages and access to, to some markets in, in Mexico and Canada, but um, I also think that they are limited in other areas as we said, um, earlier in the class, like for example, they may be losing access to some um, labor so services and capital investments because they're, they're up because of their agreement, um, the current agreement with, with these um, nations. Mm -hmm. 
there are also some some examples i can tell you an example walmart walmart is a us company and walmart expanded into mexico in a big way because of uh, nafta or after nafta walmart has significant presence in uh, mexico now walmart has many stores and walmart uh, simply uh, you know managed to transport goods from us to mexico and goods from mexico to us and it's a very easy uh, way of transporting many items as far as walmart is concerned and uh, walmart is one of the beneficiaries of nafta because uh, Walmart uh, is generating substantial revenue from Mexican market. Walmart Mexico business is a jewel in Walmart's uh, crown, actually. So such uh, some companies are beneficiaries, but some companies are losers also because uh, uh, you know they 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 have facing problems. Um, you know because uh, Mexican items uh, move to US, and uh, in case if they are low cost uh, products. Some of the U.S. companies that produces those uh, similar items, they will not find easy market. So the U.S. factory production is or has been at risk because in case if they are not in a position to have a uh, competitive cost of production in the U.S., then they have to shut down or they have some of them shut down, um, decided to shut down the factory. So it has happened in some some cases, yeah. So, but but in general, a lot of companies got more market access uh, to to different countries. Mexican companies also got market access to the U.S. because U.S. is a big market for them. But the only thing is that uh, many American buyers or consumers they don't have preference to buy Mexican brands. They prefer to buy American brands made in Mexico, but uh, many of them don't buy. Mexican brands made in Mexico. So that is a perception issue. So, uh, and, and uh, there could be cognitive bias issues as well. So question number two is that, uh, uh, you know, many US companies shifted production based to Mexico. For example, once I was in San Diego in California and uh, I went to the US Mexico border you know, so check post, what is called as check post, US Mexico check post in San Diego, California. And uh, just before reaching one or two miles away from the border, I noticed that a lot of uh, smoke in, in the sky, cloud smoke, you know, smoke, Espanol que estas, you know, so smoke, uh, the, 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 the and their sky was uh, clouded with the smoke. So, and I was trying to investigate the reasons why the sky is full of clouds and smokes, you know? So, uh, yeah, so this is mainly because many US companies have shifted production base to Mexico and a and lot of them set up their factories not far away from the check post, but they are physically located in Mexico, but they, the, their locations of those factories are geographically uh, close to the US border so that uh, they can simply transport, simply export from Mexico to the US and sell in the US as well. So I also met with a Japanese uh, uh, manager of Japanese company called Sanyo who was going to Mexico. And he told me that I'm going to Mexico because, because of NAFTA or after NAFTA, our company decided to set up a factory in Mexico, which is not far from the US. And uh, he was explaining his story or their company story, and and they, they have set up a factory in Mexico mainly because of NAFTA, and and they, they sell in Mexico. Use the whatever they produce in Mexican factory, they transport or they, they simply import from Mexico to the U.S. and then they uh, sell in the U.S. and they do the same thing in Canada too. So they do export uh, to Canada and they do export to U.S. from Mexico, and it is it is very very cost effective. Uh, from their point of view, from a Japanese company's point of view as well. Yeah, so now um, you three can answer this question. Many U.S. companies shifted production based to Mexico. For example, San Diego, U.S., Mexico border. Some other borders also probably you might know in case if you have ever traveled uh, to Mexico or if you have ever looked at U.S., Mexico border, it can be Texas border or California border, Arizona border or uh, New Mexico border. Mexico and US, uh, you know, these two countries have very, very, very long border. So, uh, yeah, many American companies shifted production base to Mexico because of NAFTA and export 
and decided to export from Mexico to US and Canada. The very fundamental question is why? And you can also go and expand into uh, how, how they do it and uh, the why is the basic reason or rational and how they do it. And uh, you can also talk about some examples that you probably would know some companies are doing it and uh, based on your information, knowledge and experience and exposure. Uh, I would appreciate if you can talk or discuss the answer with some examples and with some ideas. Yeah. So let's start with Yarlin. So um, I know the, the same example that say the question, um, San Diego next to Tijuana, I think. Um, Tijuana is a town before people, I don't know some project managers that actually live in California and travel every day just to check on the on, on everything on the projects in Mexico. And I think um, the benefit is maybe um, the labor is cheaper in Mexico. So you have a, a cheaper labor and then you can export um, the, the, the product to to United States or to Canada and sell it for for um, for more than you can sell it in Mexico. So I think, yeah, it's beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no bottle. Oh, Gabriel, Gabriel, right? It's Gabriel turn, right? Yeah, I speak in the first round. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the the why is, uh, I mean, I would say it's, it's it's easier to explain. It's basically it's, it's the the labor's cheaper, and the restrictions, the environmental restrictions are are a little bit uh, more lax as well um, over the border in Mexico. So it's um, evidently. Um, beneficial for many companies to just you know use Mexico as their production base instead of uh, operating and manufacturing from the US where it will be much more expensive and uh, it will be much more restrictive which will also increase the cost in terms of examples I <clears throat> the only example that comes to mind is from experience previous previous job I had was with chemicals, it was a the chemical industry, and we um, company I worked with was a multinational company, had uh, operations all over the world, and uh, we made a lot of uh, chemicals for cleaning and laundry products, uh, but industrial type of laundry products. So we had the situation, especially in Puerto Rico, where uh, trans transport costs are extremely expensive. Um, and so many of the customers that we have here were asking for uh, better prices. But of course, that doesn't happen often. Usually you increase the prices. So one of the strategies that we use or the tactics that, that we use uh, or try to implement was instead of, uh, of getting our products from the U.S. market, we tried to use the, uh, uh, the ability that we had through the company to get our product instead of uh, from the US, uh, we, we switch some of the products to get them from Mexico. We had, it was basically the same product, different branding, but basically the same product and the same uh, quality. Um, and uh, it was a lot cheaper if we were able to uh, manage the transportation costs, etc. cetera. So that, that's a, the, the first example that jumped to mind um, from like a, a bigger example from the news or, or something like that. There's, I'm, I'm sure there's probably a lot, but I, no, nothing comes to mind right now. Um, pro professor, um, uh, adding to what Gabriel said, um, thinking on the accounting perspective, uh, probably this US company um, do that uh, because of uh, tax, Tax implication. Uh, probably, if they um, do that, they uh, in accounting there are some um, terms like uh, uh, transfer pricing or all that stuff where you can um, tax some 
products um, in your subsidiary that you have in another country. Uh, in that way, you can um, like don't pay well, like limit uh, the the tax that you have to to pay. Yeah, Jennifer. Oh, yes, I think um, because of Mexico's proximity to the U.S. and investment relationship under the NAFTA, also like, like my partner said, the lower cost, um, I think also the strong cultural and economic ties that connect the two countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh... We have to move on and uh, we also have some videos, but maybe videos could be after the break and let's see that. And uh, so let's look at other regional uh, economic integration and other regions in the world. Andean Pact. Andean Pact, uh, uh, this is a regionally economic integration area. And this is uh, uh, between Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. And this started as a preferential trade agreement, like in South Asia, South Asian preferential trade agreement. However, this was not very successful. Again, in 1990, they relaunched the pact aiming at a free trade area by 1992, but didn't work out due to difference of opinion. Yeah, so this is a... Uh, You can see that uh, and in fact, uh, aiming at a free trade area by 1992, I mean, they originally established as a free trade agreement, no preferential trade agreement, you know, almost every regional economically integrated region, they start with preferential trade agreement, then they move on to free trade area. And then they think that there is a lot of unity among them. Then they think about uh, advanced form like common market or customs union or political union. So that is so possible only if there is 100% unity among member countries. If there is no unity among member countries, they can only do number one or number two. They cannot move, they cannot move ahead of number two uh, in case if there is difference of opinion. So among these countries, there was difference of opinion, these South American countries. So they decided to suspend their pact so, and then after some years, they relaunched the pact aiming for a free trade area. Again, it didn't work because of difference of opinion. Because sometimes some countries th think that this free trade agreement is not going to help my country. The government will not take initiative. They might experiment for a couple of years. And then they feel that this is not going to be beneficial for my country. Then they will stop or they will withdraw. They will suspend. This is what happened in this region. It's like when you do business, you have a business partner. So it can be local business also. So when you have a business partner and after uh, doing business with him or with her for one or two years, you will look at, you will review what is the uh, situation, you know? So, and and, uh, and, and uh, as part of that review, you can decide, you know, how it works and how it not works and all those kind of things. Nineteen eighty-eight free trade pact between Brazil and Argentina. Later, Paraguay and Uruguay joined. In two thousand one, Argentina wanted to suspend Mercosur's tariff structure, and Brazil agreed to do this, putting an end to their free trade pact for the time being. This is another thing. Yeah, so this is uh, Mercosur. Mercosur also had its own problem. Mercosur was not successful. It is not successful. So this is a free trade pact between Brazil and Argentina and Paraguay and Uruguay also joined between four countries. And it was established in 1988. However, in the year 2001, Argentina wanted to suspend Mercosur's tariff structure because Argentine companies and Argentine people thought that this is not going to help Argentine companies and Argentine people. So they decided to suspend, they decided to withdraw from this agreement. And Brazil agreed to 
Argentina's request and that uh, resulted into an end to their free trade pact for the time being, Mercosur. Again, there have been negotiations and uh, to reactivate it, but there are some, some advancements and some developments in that regard. ASEAN, Association of South Asian Countries. Uh, these are countries located in Southeast Asia. Member countries of ASEAN, Brunei, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. They are the members of these ASEAN countries. ASEAN is a free trade area, and ASEAN is also in a very advanced stage. ASEAN is actually operating like a common market now, but it is not a classic form of common market because there are some restrictions on visa uh, when a company employing a foreign uh, citizen from another country. So like Singapore doesn't permit uh, uh, to, to uh, welcome people from Thailand or Vietnam or Laos and Malaysia to Malaysia, there is special provision in Singapore, but uh, other countries, they have to get work with us to work in Singapore. So it's not really classic form of common market, but they are aiming for common market. They have already said that they have implemented free movement of people for visit reason, for visiting each other, but uh, for work, there are some restrictions existing. Uh, so, so that means that um, people, for example, from Thailand cannot uh, work on Brenny or other other members in that group? No, they can see, they have to get the work permit or visa. So that is the okay. thing, okay. And uh, so work permit or visa means it is a government discretion. So suppose you employ a foreign citizen and government will decide, government can still deny because if government uh, will have policies like quota system for work permit or visa, Governments uh, keep uh, like how many visas can be issued to foreigners in a year because government keep those quota restrictions mainly because government want to ensure employment opportunities to the local citizens. So that is the reason government keep those kind of restrictions. So uh, ASEAN countries, they have implemented uh, some advancements in that kind of things in case if a government, sorry, if, if a company is employing a foreign citizen government should not block that is their rule but it is not automatic but in gulf cooperation council where there is a common market it is automatic work permit is automatic company has to just file it and it is, it is an automatic approval so but in in asean it is not automatic approval it is it is just to be with the government approval so uh you know so in 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 in, in nafta governments can still deny such a request from companies when companies employ citizens in case if the total number of visas issued in the country to the foreign citizen from so and so country exceeds the total number of visas issued that that means they can say that you hire next year you can delay it many many uh visas are delayed in the us for foreign citizens for a year or two. Many times companies hire someone and then companies apply and government uh, uh, will delay it for a year. So because government would say that total quota exceeds and if total quota exceeds, foreigners uh, will have to wait for visas. Many, many, many people uh, are in wait list for work visa in the US, for example. Thank you. APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Corporation, founded in 1990 at the suggestion of Australia. And APEC has 18 member states, including such economic powerhouses as the US, Japan, and Canada. Yeah, SARC and SAPTA. South SARC stands for South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka are members, as you established in 1985. Cooperation in the area of trade is the top priority. SAFTA doesn't work, but SAPTA works. Yeah, SAPTA means 
preferential trade agreement. PTA means preferential trade agreement. FTA means free trade agreement. PTA is the first step towards FTA. FTA is number two. What we have seen in the classification one, two, three, four, five. FTA is number two stage and PTA is number one stage. PTA stands for preferential trade agreement. FTA stands for free trade agreement. Yeah, in South Asia, there is PTA called SAPTA. It's just PTA. It is not a full free trade agreement for commodities because it doesn't work because there is no unity among country governments. So they have only reduced customs tax for trade among themselves, but it is not full free trade. That is why I have written here, SAPTA doesn't work, but SAPTA works. So difference between SAPTA and SAPTA. What is the difference? Somebody can tell me the difference between SAPTA and SAPTA. Hmm? Well, if it's a free trade agreement, um, the barriers to trade are not simply lowered. It's a, the, more like they don't exist. You can have free trade through the area. If it's a preferential trade agreement, there, there are some barriers. It's just that they're lower right, to make it easier. Yeah, so it's called preferential because the customs tax is various. Customs taxes still exist, but customs tax rate charged for items coming from their collaboration member countries will be less than the customs tax that they charge uh, for items coming from non-member countries. So that is why it's called preferential trade agreement, but customs tax exists when there is preferential trade agreement. But when there is free trade agreement, like EFTA, NAFTA is a free trade agreement, when there is free trade agreement, there is no customs tax. ASEAN, originally it was established in 1967. Five original members, ASEAN has five original members, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. Brunei, Darussalam, Vietnam, and Laos, and Myanmar, and Cambodia join later. ASEAN is aiming for AFTA. European Union. European Union is the next form. European Union tends to be political union with 27 countries. And here, We have to also look at the reasons for having only 12 countries in Euro currency area, whereas there are 27 countries in European Union. So Euro currency area has only 12 countries. However, European Union has 27 and it's expanding it's in 28 and those kind of things. Could be next year, it can be 29, so like that. So, uh, you know, so European Union is an economic union. It turns out to be a political union with 27, 28 countries. And among the European Union countries, there is a subset called economic community where euro currency exists. So the next. Uh, okay, so this is uh, finished and uh, uh yeah any questions if you have any question i can answer mm -hmm. are there any anything else in the world similar to the european union no european union is the most advanced classic form of regional economic integration okay Other regions have advanced to the extent of European Union. 
in European Union, what is the beauty of European Union? Tell me, how does European Union work? Suppose you have a Spanish passport, you have a uh, you know, German passport, you can go to any European Union country and live there without a job. You don't need a job to live in any other country within the European Union. So many people do that these days. Many people from Poland, they simply go to many other European Union countries and simply live there. I, I, I met with a Polish girl in uh, Netherlands in Holland when I was visiting Amsterdam. And she told me she was waitress in the restaurant where I was having my dinner. And she told me she is a lawyer from Poland, but working as a waitress in a restaurant in Amsterdam. What is the reason? Hmm. If she if she was an attorney, maybe she haven't passed the bar exam in that country. I know the bar exam. European Union help her to work in any European Union. She can simply go to European Union, and in Holland, she gets uh, seven times more salary than uh, Poland. Uh, and uh, maybe I did not ask her whether she passed bar exam in Poland or not. But even if she passed and she works as a lawyer in Poland she will make $1,000 in Poland per month. In Holland, as a waiter, in Netherlands, as a waitress, she can still make $3,000. So she, she, she makes more money as a waiter in, in, in Holland than as an attorney in, in Poland, right? Yes, yes. So, wow. that is, so European Union facilitate that. Any, any type of any law grade job is fine. So I mean, you don't even need a job to live in Amsterdam for a Polish citizen. So, uh, you know, so you can simply go and, 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 and live there also in case if you, if you can find an apartment to live. So she, she finds it, 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 it even, even waitress job is better than working as a lawyer in her own country. So there are a lot of, lot of, lot of people, uh, you know, are doing that in European Union now. So in case if they cannot make enough money in their own country by way of uh, doing the job that they can do in their own country, they simply go to another country and do the job, whatever they, they think that they can do and make more money. And UK was also flooded by people from several Eastern European countries and several other European countries. One reason why UK government decided or UK people voted uh, for Brexit is also this because their country was getting flooded with uh, people from other European Union countries. They were all going to UK because UK is an English speaking country. It was an English speaking destination. It was an easy destination for them to simply travel and go and uh, find some accommodation and look for a job in UK. And, and even if they don't get a job, they will simply live there or they will find some uh, some uh, uh, a British man, some, you know, so, or British, uh, or, or if someone is a girl from another European Union country, they will find a British man, or otherwise, if someone is a man from another European country, they will find a British girl. So that, that the people were doing that also, because you know, if they are not getting job, people were doing that. You know? <laughs> I mean, so if they were getting job, that is fine. So, so I suppose if they work as a waitress or waiter in, in UK or Holland, Holland means Netherlands, they can still make three thousand dollars, and and uh, they will not make uh, three thousand dollars in in countries like Czech Republic or Poland or some other European Union countries, even if they have a white collar job. Okay. Wow. So uh, European, because European Union has a lot of uh, you know differences in terms of income also in different regions. It's, it's, Europe is a small region, but at the same time, every country, the income potential in every country is different. So some countries uh, offer opportunities for high income, some countries do not offer opportunities for high income. Yeah, so this is a very common thing in Europe. As uh, you can also see when you travel to Europe, supposing even the cost of many items are also uh, like that. But uh, with the integration, cost has gone up. Like I lived in many European countries. I lived in uh, France for about uh, five months, and I lived in Germany for about six months, and I lived in uh, Warsaw, uh, Poland for. I was a visiting professor in uh, Warsaw University for a month. Yeah, I lived there for forty days, and. Uh, uh, but the cost in Warsaw, Poland is more uh, actually is almost equal to cost in uh, some of the other European countries like Germany. It is 
not almost equal, but approximately 70% of the cost of what I found, but, but they don't make enough money in Poland. So uh, Polish people are handsome, Polish people are beautiful, but at the same time, unfortunately, they do not make enough income in Poland. The salary level is not high at all. And, uh, uh, but cost of living in Warsaw is high. So it is, I, I, I was surprised to see that the cost of living is high and they do not make enough salary and it is difficult for them to live. Of course, in case if they have their parents' house to live, parents' apartment or house to live, then it is okay. Otherwise it is difficult to, uh, uh, to live in, in a country like Poland with income, very, very nominal income uh, in, in, in those kind of countries. But because of European Union integration, cost has gone up also. Because if there was no integration, there should have been control. They, they could have easily controlled the cost of living in those countries. Now what has happened is that people, people from developed countries in Europe, people from rich countries in Europe, they simply travel to low-income countries in Europe and they spend uh, uh, money in, in low-income countries. So price level in low-income countries have increased or gone up because of that reason. You know. Yeah, any questions? I met an Estonian girl in Norway too. Norway is not in European Union, but technically Norway permits a European Union citizen to uh, travel and work in Norway without any visa too. So they need some permission to live without uh, work in, in Norway, but Norway is a very high income country. This Estonian girl, what she was doing in Norway is that she is a coffee maker in Norway. And uh, in Norway, nor, you know, Norway, Norway and Switzerland uh, are high wage countries. You know, so in Norway, you have to pay five bucks to buy a coffee. Uh, the average cost for a coffee in any, any shop is $5. And uh, uh, she can easily make, even if she's doing coffee making job in a cafeteria in Norway, she can still make uh, $4,000 or $5,000 per month in Norway as a coffee maker. But in Estonia, uh, Estonia, if she is doing the same job in Estonia, she will only make $500. So $500 in Estonia and uh, I, in Norway, she will make $4,000 as a coffee maker, so eight times more. So, and she has European Union passport being uh, a person from Estonia. Estonia is part of European Union and, and uh, uh, Norway permit Estonian, so European Union passport holders to work in Norway. They don't need any work permit in Norway because it is automatic work permit. So uh, even though Norway is technically not part of European Union, Norway recognizes that, but uh, uh, you know, so, but there are some guidelines in Norway, some restrictions are there because Norway is not technically, or Norway is not legally member of European Union, but Norway is not blocking European Union members. If a Norwegian uh, company or Norwegian enterprise is employing them, Norway government is not blocking. So this girl is employed by a Norway company, Nor Nor Norway citizen owned company. So Norway, she, Norwegian government doesn't block even if it is a low grade job, but in, in, in other parts of the world, like for example, in any other parts of the world, for example, I tell you some, some rules. In the US, there is a salary range. Uh, then only US government is giving visas without delay or without restriction to the foreigners. The salary level, minimum salary level, I think it is uh, $50,000 or something like that it has to be earned by Foreigner. If some jobs are less than fifty thousand dollars, government is not giving keen to give uh, work visas to uh, foreign citizens because government doesn't want foreign citizen to come and do the laundry job, or they don't want uh, the government doesn't want loan, uh, foreign citizen to come and do the cleaning job and those kind of jobs. Law grade jobs government doesn't want. Only skilled jobs government want to encourage foreign citizens. The same story in other countries also, like in government in India when an Indian company is hiring uh, foreigners, government has a rule. This person should get at least $25,000 in a year as salary. If any company is offering less than $25,000 yearly salary, that person is not eligible for a work visa. So that is the condition. So likewise, every country, many countries have this kind of restrictions. 
normally, you know, when when companies employ uh, foreign citizens and and uh, apply for work visa from the government, but however, in European Union, because of this integration, that such rules are not there. Such rules doesn't exist. Any job doesn't matter. So you can simply go if you are a European Union citizen. So you go go and work whatever job you do, cleaning job, salary doesn't matter. Whatever salary you go and leave anywhere you want to live in European Union. That is the beauty of European Union. And I have a, like my, my Orlando student, my student from Venezuela, this gentleman, yeah, he was very friendly with me. So, but now I'm not in touch with him. I think he has forgotten me. I have forgotten him also. This gentleman is from Venezuela, but he's, uh, he was my student in Orlando, Florida. And what he did was that Venezuela was going to turbulence and he managed to get a Spanish passport because his grandfather is from Spain. So uh, it was difficult for him to get a good job in the US, but he managed to get a passport from Spain when Venezuela, you know, Venezuelan government, then Venezuela pro people, everything was problem in Venezuela. And I think it's still problem in Venezuela. So, uh, and he managed to get a Spanish passport and well, he simply moved to Spain. And then from the Spain, then I think the Spanish passport is a European Union and Spain passport, Spain and European Union. Uh, so he simply moved to England, and uh, but uh, by the time Brexit came, so <laughs> with the Brexit he could not, you know. So, uh, but still, even if he is, he has trouble in the UK, he can simply go to Germany or he can go to Netherlands. He can go to you know some other European Union countries. Even if he is not getting a good job in Spain, he is okay to get a you know he can get a job in some other European Union country, you know, and he can work. And a lot of people have done that. I know, like when I was. Uh, visiting professor in Paris, I met with a lot of Martinico people, you know, Martinico. Martinico, it's a Caribbean island, right? Yeah, it's, it's a French territory. People in Martinico island in Caribbean, they have French passport. And with the European Union, what they have done is that they have used their French passport to migrate to European Union countries and they are not necessarily staying in France. They are everywhere in Europe. And their passport simply says European Union, France. So their passport has no information that they are from Martinico. So, but they have a European Union passport and, and they, they, a lot of them have moved from Martinico to European Union. So this is this kind of impact, you know, European Union help and they, they are not necessarily going to France. They are everywhere in European Union. Wherever they get a job, they live the in European Union. You know. Yeah. So there are same similar stories. There are a couple of other European islands also in Caribbean. You know about this uh, French Dutch island in Caribbean. Hmm. St. Martin, St. Martin. Yeah, St. Martin is half Dutch and half French. They have European Union passport too. Okay, you have any questions now? So I have a question for you to answer. Let's say you are a CEO or vice president of an American company wanting to expand into Europe and you have never set up a factory in Europe. What countries you would think about setting up factory and on what conditions and what criteria and what would be the reasons for selecting those countries? How many countries in European Union you need a factory? Is open for answers. Anybody can answer. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, what I can say is that uh, a lot of American companies have had a, a, a hard way to come to Europe. I think the best example is Walmart. They haven't have a good time there and they have tried really hard, but they uh, did not pass. But I think it would be like searching for any treaties or, or, or how many quotas would be for an American country, for an American company to go there to Europe. But a specific uh, place in Europe, uh, maybe the biggest countries is Spain or or France or Italy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So others, I I truly have no no idea which country is best. But I was I was uh, looking at a, at an article now, and uh, apparently the Czech Republic is a really good place to. Uh, for manufacturing in general but i don't know why <laughs> just throwing it out there but i have no idea i mean i know uh from experience uh it's uh at least in the countries have uh, i know better um like the uk and germany and france it's 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 not the best environment i mean i wouldn't choose those countries to have manufacturing uh, operation there um but you know, there are many other countries in the European, European Union, like apparently the Czech Republic, where uh, there's a favor, uh, favorable environment. So. Mm -hmm. Any other answer? So uh, I'm speaking from my experience. I work for pharmaceuticals. So we have companies to work, uh, that we work with in Switzerland and Germany. So. Uh, I still don't know why, maybe um, um, the engineers there are really good, so I choose um, any of both. Uh, Switzerland and Germany are high income countries, and uh, I mean, you know, so of course, sales, buying and selling, that's a different game or that's a different type of business. I mean, that you can do with Switzerland or Germany or anything. So, I mean, so because if you want to sell, probably you might try to sell in Germany or Switzerland. I mean, in case, of, especially if your product is highly priced and you want to sell, so you might target those countries. But my question was slightly different. My question was that, suppose if you want to set up a factory and you want to sell all over, the, you have an interest to sell all over Europe and you don't want to export from America to Europe. So you have a long-term interest in Europe and you want to set up a factory in Europe. That was my question. What countries you would prefer to set up a factory so that you know, if you prefer to set up a factory in one country, you have to look at logistic aspects to transport your product from that particular location to all other European Union countries. You have to also look at cost of production in that country. So uh, cost of production, good cost of waste, land and everything. So if you need a factory, you need land and then you need uh, a people to be employed and so many things like that. So uh, you don't need a factory in every European Union country because European Union is operating like a single country. When they are operating like a single country, you don't need multiple factories. You can just have one factory and uh, you can simply import from that country, that factory to the rest of Europe because they, there are no customs taxes, there are no import restrictions when, when they do trade each other from a factory in that country. That is my question. Yeah, and the other, Charlie? Yes, I do. In that case, maybe again, on my, on my experience, we, don't have, we do have uh, like twins, twins building in, uh, in England. So I think maybe it's for the taxes in there. So maybe it's a good place you can ship from there. Or sometimes you can also have two factories. For example, you want you want to sell. You, you said let's say Europe uh, Europe has uh, two three different regions. Let's say Latin Europe, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Uh, even to some extent France. So Portugal, Spain, Italy—they are geographically close. They are geographically proximate. 
So in, in case if you want to set up two factories, one can be in Portugal, you know, in the region where uh, Portugal, Italy, and Spain are located. One can be in one of those countries. And if you if you want to have two factories, and second one can be somewhere in Central Europe, like Poland or Czech Republic or Slovakia. You know, these three countries are low cost countries. These three countries are low cost, low income countries. And uh, uh, if, if you set up a factory in uh, Poland, you can easily sell in Germany. And if you set up a factory in Czech Republic or Slovakia also, you can easily sell in Switzerland and uh, Italy and uh, Germany and many other European Union countries. Because they are joking, Austria and all can be Austria is very close to Czech Republic and Slovakia. So uh, these kind of countries you can easily sell. I mean, in, you can sell in Netherlands also very close to those uh, Czech Republic. I mean, Czech Republic is also proximate to Poland. So it is part of uh, Central, uh, Central Europe. So you have to identify low cost countries in Central Europe if you want to sell in high income countries in Central Europe and uh, low cost countries include Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland and those kind of countries in uh, uh, or even Hungary. Hungary is also European Union countries. Hungary is a very low cost country too. And um, Hungary is also, you know, I mean, Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Slovakia, they all have similar cost structure, similar income structure and similar uh cost of production structure where salaries are very low so if you can set up one factory in that uh, one of those uh, relatively low cost location and then easily sell from that location to uh, other high cost uh, locations in europe and uh, you can price uh, according to your price product price can be high in uh, high income countries and you can save money by producing in low income european union country that is the benefit And if you have an aggressive plan and you can set up two factories, one can be maybe probably in Spain, uh, if, if you want to target uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and if you have a heavy product and all, but otherwise you can even still transport, you can still export from any of those uh, Eastern or Central European countries to the Northern Europe or, uh, I mean, uh, to, to uh, Latin Europe also. It is, it is uh, very easy to do it, it's not complicated because they, are, they don't have any customs tax restrictions. Uh, uh, professor, um, yeah. also, uh, I was reading an article, uh, for example, the United Kingdom uh, has a boost of strong economies in, in the world, and also it has a strong transportation link with a large airport, a more major city, and have many links to Europe. So I think that uh, the United Kingdom uh, could be a, an option if uh, I want to expand my, my operation to Europe. Uh, United Kingdom is now an independent country. United Kingdom has moved out from European Union, right? I mean, uh, that is called Brexit. So United Kingdom, you need a different setup now. So why, you know, so like suppose, uh, I mean, uh, you, you see, you can still export United Kingdom from Poland or to other European Union countries, or whatever you produce in other European countries, but there is going to be tax in Europe, in, in England, when now British people import from other countries, there is going to be customs tax because of Brexit. But before Brexit, when UK was part of European Union, there was no customs tax. Now with the Brexit, there will be customs tax. So cost of the import will increase in UK. So, you know, so that is the important factor, okay.